I'll do be seated. Well, year on year, the Christmas decorations that we see on the houses around us seem to get more and more elaborate. Even I've joined in with my nativity-themed lights on the outside of my house. On the vicarage there, you can see Mary and Joseph. Um, on one window, we've got a shepherd and a sheep on another. Walk round the house to the front door and you'll see Magi. I think it's a welcome change from Santa and snowmen and giant penguins. No offence if you've got those things in your garden. <laughs> well, I'm hoping they can be seen even from the train and that people will think, oh yeah, the nativity story. I think not being able to go out as much, and certainly last year we couldn't go out at all, could we, because of the lockdown. It's meant more of a focus on the home and on the smaller family unit. But it also seems to me that maybe the decorations are used as a distraction too. Something to push back the pain and the fears about the future. I think almost two years of isolation has led us to be an angrier, less tolerant world. Old certainties have been shaken. Support structures have been broken. Faith in science has ebbed away. And we in the church are not immune from any of that at all. We've also suffered from restrictions. We've got sick. We might even have lost loved ones. We've been led to ask questions about God and God's plans. And as we reach another Christmas, with all of the fears that are growing again, both with COVID, with the threat from Russia, how do we press on in faith and hope? Well, as always, we must look to God's word to see what God has got to say about it. And in our passage from Paul's letter to the Philippians this morning, we have got some really good advice. Paul tells us the way to live as individuals and collectively as the church. And he says that in order to function properly and to really experience all that God's got to offer, we need to have a, a right perspective, right praying, right thinking and right living. And in this little passage we've got, he'll take us through all of those. So it'd be really good to turn back to the passage in your church Bibles. And you'll see what he's saying as we go through it. Now the verses start in verse 4 with one of my favourite verses in the scripture. It's actually the verse that was written inside the Bible that I was given in Sunday school when I was nine years old. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now, in difficult times, that could seem like a harsh thing to say. A bit like saying to somebody who's depressed, come on, cheer up. But it could seem like that if we didn't know where Paul was when he wrote those words. Because Paul was in prison, literally in chains for his faith in the Lord Jesus. He was in Rome awaiting an appeal to Caesar, his future deeply uncertain. Yet even there, in those terrible circumstances, Paul was able to rejoice. How could he do that? Well, he could do it because he knew one really important and vital fact. It's at the end of verse 5. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. And he was near in two ways. Firstly, he was there by his Holy Spirit with Paul all of the time. And secondly, he was going to return and right all of the wrongs when he came in judgment. Now, many of you know that I enjoy watching Doctor Who. They're not really these last couple of series, not so, not so uh, pleased with those. I was remembering back to some of the, the old ones from my childhood, the Tom Baker ones, which are my favourites. Show my age a little bit there. And often an episode there would end with the Doctor in some dire, dire situation, completely doomed. And your heart would be in your mouth thinking, how can the Doctor ever get out of that situation? 
And you'd have to wait a whole week to find out what happened next. But then, when we got to the next week, often, well always, the doctor would escape. And often, the escape would be quite simple and straightforward. Nothing to panic about at all. And if I went back and watched the previous episode, you watch it in a completely different light because you know exactly how the doctor's going to get out of the situation. And that's how it is here with Paul. Paul knows how things will turn out. Now he doesn't know what's going to happen to him. He doesn't know if he's going to die in prison. He doesn't know if he gets his, his time with Caesar whether he'll get a pardon or whether he'll get executed. And of course, Paul does end up being martyred. But he knows that whatever happens, it will be okay. Because God is with him and Jesus will return. And the same is true for us as well. We do know how things will turn out because God has told us. He's also told us that there will be troubles that we will come under attack, that there will be wars and rumours of wars, that there will be plagues and all sorts of other things going on. But Jesus will return. Jesus will return. The Lord is near. And as we wait, we can know his presence with us, even through the most trying of times. And that is how we can rejoice. And that attitude of hope leads to gentleness in the way that we behave. We don't have to fight and rage against everything. The Lord is near. It's in hand. We can rest in him. And it is all about keeping this right perspective. And with that right perspective comes the need for the right sort of praying. Because though our hearts find rest in Jesus, we're not called to just sit back and do nothing. We're told to pray. And Paul tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, no, Paul doesn't just say, oh, pray about it and you'll feel better. He gives us a specific way of praying, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving. That means we come to God with thankful hearts to start with, because God has done so much for us already. But lots of the time we need to take a step back and consciously remember that, actually remind ourselves of the things that God has done. That was something I was reminded of this week. I was in the, the doldrums about the delay of the project. And someone said, well, remember what God has already done. Three years ago, we could only dream of being where we are now. And it is absolutely true. Even when everything goes wrong, we can look back and see where God has been at work. Those little touches of grace on our lives. As well as, of course, the slightly bigger matter of our salvation. Mm -hmm. All that Jesus has already done for us. His death on the cross for us. Paying the price for our sin. His resurrection, bringing us new life. Those things are certain. Jesus has already done them. We can always rejoice in those. No matter what else is going on in our lives or in the world. And in that context, that context of knowing that we are loved, that we are saved, that we are taken care of forever, we can bring our requests to God. And it is okay to ask for specific things. Things like an answer to a question or a resolution to a problem. Because God sometimes answers those requests with surprising speed. This week, going back to our, our project, we were desperate about how to pay for the flooring in the cafe. We need it. We don't have a floor in the cafe. We can't operate the cafe. We can't operate the cafe. We can't do the project. So we had to kind of borrow money from different parts of the accounts and one thing and another. And it was all a little bit desperate. 
But then about, because we all prayed about it, we were all given the task as PCC to pray about this specifically and a few other things as well. And about an hour after I sent the email around to everybody on Friday, another email pinged into my inbox. And it was from a grant provider that we'd kind of given up hope on, really. We hadn't heard anything from them. We thought, well, that's, that's it. They don't want to give us anything. And there was a grant for £5,000 for flooring <laughs> and decoration. Exactly what we needed. God answered a specific prayer in a very specific way. Of course, sometimes he does that. Sometimes he makes us wait for other reasons. There's other things he needs to teach us. But God does answer our prayers. And if we ask specifically, we get those specific answers often too. And it's also okay to ask God to take the burden of something. And that's a prayer I pray often when I wake up in the night and something's going round and round and round in my mind. I say, Lord, I can't do anything about this right now. Please take it. And give me a new perspective in the morning. And I often do that. I often need to do that. But God does it. And what a privilege it is to be able to give our burdens to God. He's the maker of the universe. Yet we can give our burdens to him. And know that he will take them. And then when we wake in the morning, he'll help us to deal with them. Because he's with us, the Lord is near. And prayer really is a precious gift. And it comes with a beautiful promise, verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful promise? Hearts and minds guarded by him. Well, Along with that right perspective and right praying, there is something for us to do. We do need to practice right thinking. Now, as Christians, we've got a responsibility to live in a way that brings honour to Jesus. And we don't do this naturally. We're fallen human beings. And so we need to make a conscious effort. And it starts with what we think about. And Paul tells us to think about things which are true, noble, right, pure, lovely and admirable. <clears throat> and if something's worthy of praise, then we must praise it. See, what we think about is really important because what is in our hearts <clears throat> will eventually come out of our mouths. And that applies to the things that we look at on Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and other parts of the internet as well. If we look at things that are filled with hate, then that affects the way we start viewing others. It's the same with pornography. It's the same with some of the more hysterical conspiracy theorists, and there are plenty of those about. What we fill our minds with really matters, because it influences who we are and how we act. So be deliberate in your thinking. Be deliberate in what you're looking at on the internet. Ask, is this true and right and lovely? Or is it not? And if it's not, ask God to help you make a conscious effort to stop and focus on something that is true and right and lovely. Right thinking is really important. Because it does lead to right living. And a good role model can help us know what living a godly life can look like. Paul suggested in his letter that the people in the church in Philippi use him as a role model. He said, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Of course, we're really fortunate today. We've got so many more role models that we can look to as we go back through history. And it can be really good to read biographies of great Christian figures of the past. They can be inspiring. They can give us strength, seeing how people have lived the life of faith. 
And don't forget, we also have modern day role models. We are role models to one another. Now that's a daunting thought, isn't it? But it's true because the way you live influences other people. Especially if you're an older member of the church or you've got a position of responsibility within the church. People are looking at you, looking at me, but not just me, you know, looking at all of us to set that good example. How we behave affects everyone. But the way to do it is not to get down on yourself, because we can do that as well, particularly if we're a certain type of character. But by focusing back on that right perspective, the Lord is near, Jesus will return. By praying in the right way, asking with thankfulness specific things, focusing on thinking of the good things, true and lovely, and living in the right way. And it brings a wonderful benefit. It brings the benefit of peace. All the while we try to live outside of God's plans for us, there is a struggling, a wrestling going on. But living in the way God commands us to live brings peace, says Paul. And he gave all of this advice to a church that he loved very much. A church that he wanted to see being really effective and strong in its community. And similarly, we're cherished by God as well. God wants us to be effective. He wants us to know his peace. He wants us to know his love. He wants us to be effective in reaching others and helping others as well, being a beacon of love in our community. And that is not easy. We can so quickly slip into apathy or to thinking that we've done our bit. So we slowly stop being the church that God wants us to be. So Paul's advice is practice right praying, right thinking, right living, and God's peace will be with us. So may his kingdom of peace and of joy be extended this Christmas. Amen. Amen. On the word of prayer, our loving Father, we thank you so much for those words of Paul. We thank you that you guided him to write those and that they were kept in the Holy Scriptures for us to, to read and learn and put into practice. So we, we pray that you would forgive us for the times when we've just focused on our own situation, our own problems, the things that worry us. We haven't stepped back and looked at the big perspective. Oh, help us to do that. Help us to know that because Jesus is returning and because you've given your Holy Spirit to us, things will be okay. You will hold our hand and be with us through whatever life throws at us. We thank you so much for that. And we pray that you would help us to pray in the way that you have laid out. Oh, forgive us when we try everything else to fix things and then we come to you in prayer. Oh, help us to come to you with our prayers and petitions. Help us to have thankful hearts as we give praise to you for all that you've done for us. We pray too that you'd give us strength and courage to think about, to look at, the things that are true and lovely. Forgive us when we've been tempted by the things we see on the internet, the things our friends, our peers are, are watching. We've been taken away from you and our hearts have been changed, not for the best. Oh, bring us back. Help us to make that conscious choice to, to fill our, our minds with things that are good. And then we pray, Father, that that would flow over into our lives. Help us to live lives that are good, are truthful, are lovely, are admirable. Not so that people might look at us and think, oh, well, aren't they great? But so that they might see you in us. Or oh, help us to be good role models to one another. And help us to shine your light into our community. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to continue in prayer now. Ian is going to lead us. Thank you.